All right, welcome back, everybody. If you're just joining us, welcome to the Energy Law and Policy Conference hosted by the University of Wyoming. Uh, for those of you who are just joining, uh, just a note that our program is available on the website. If you Google UW Energy Law Conference, you can find it that way. And I see that Emily just posted a link to the program in the chat as well. And also a quick note that we are utilizing the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen uh, to ask questions of the panelists. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to our next panel, which is Hot Topics in Oil and Gas. And the moderator for this panel is Katie Schroeder, who is a partner at Davis, Graham and Stubbs. Um, where she has a practice that focuses on all aspects of energy development on federal lands. And Katie, I think you are the only panelist who's not a UW graduate, but you are, you've been such a great partner over the years. We'll give you, I'll grant you an honorary degree as moderator for today. So thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, Temple. I'm excited to add that to my bio. Um, Thanks everyone for having me as a, uh, uh, even though despite not being a UW grad, I'm excited to introduce my next, this next panel. I think this is gonna be a robust discussion on hot topics in oil and gas, particularly as they re relate to Wyoming. First, we have uh, Pete Obermuller, who is the president of the Petroleum Association of Wyoming. He's been with uh, the Petroleum Association since January of 2019. And he represents oil and Wyoming's oil and gas industry at the local, state, and federal level. He's a graduate of high school from Casper and has a master's degree in public policy from the University of Minnesota. He spent some time in Washington, DC, and then moved back to Wyoming in 2013 to head up the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. Following Pete, we'll have Phil Lowe with the Department of the Interior's Rocky Mountain Regional Solicitor's Office in Lakewood, Colorado. Phil advises interior agency clients on legal and policy matters related to conventional, conventional and renewable energy development on the public lands. Um, he, Phil works um, extensively with, um, in appeals before the Interior Board of Land Appeals and also in litigation in the federal courts. He advises BLM, particularly on uh, issues arising under the National Environmental Policy Act and the Federal Land Policy and Management Act. He was formerly a hydrologist and environmental scientist at, in the utility management and licensing sector of a major electrical utility, and before then was um, affiliated with two large law firms in San Francisco and Denver. He is a graduate of Rutgers University and has a JD from the University of Texas at Austin. Finally, we have Alex Obrecht, who's with Baker Hostetler here in Denver. Um, Alex co concentrates his practice on energy regulation and litigation. He, ha he devotes con a considerable part of his practice to oil and gas development on federal lands, as well as hazardous materials, transportation and compliance and oil and gas royalties. Alex is a Wyoming native. He holds his JD from the University of Wyoming and a BA in Harvard, from Harvard. Prior to law school, Alex worked with a Switzerland based investment bank. So first up, we're, we're going to hear from Pete Overmuller, and so I will not take much more of your time. And Pete, I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Thanks very much. Well, thanks very much, Katie. I appreciate it. Uh, trust you can hear me okay? Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, the invitation to, to be with you this afternoon. Uh, quite frankly, I'm, I'm more interested in what Phil and Alex have to say. Uh, so uh, the, what I'd like to do for you this afternoon is just do a little bit of level setting about what's going on in Wyoming and uh, about the way that we see uh, moving forward in a, a climate of um, uh, really uh, increasing demands uh, on the oil and gas uh, sector, both demands for um, reduced emissions and, uh, and carbon-free energy development, as well as increased demands for our product. Uh, it's an interesting time to be in this, in this business. And so I'm just gonna spend a few minutes of your time with apologies to those of you on uh, from the ENR division of the Wyoming Bar. Some of this will be, the first part will be repetitive to you. Uh, and then after that, maybe uh, some of that will be new. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, you can go to the next slide, please, Christine. Thanks for doing that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's going on in Wyoming uh, and, uh, and about those dueling demands. Uh, and, 
it, it seems like it may uh, be um, uh, maybe not so important to talk about what the demand is uh, and what those projections look like, though I find myself having to, to say it over and over again, because the repeated narrative uh, that we see in the press and, and even uh, interestingly, in Wyoming, when we uh, listen to legislators speak and uh, et cetera, is that uh, you know fossil fuels are, uh, if not already dead, they're uh, they're dying, uh, or that they're going away, and all of that. And as it relates to Wyoming's revenue structure, it's probably good to think that uh, they need to take steps there. Uh, but however, the facts and the projections simply don't uh, bear that out. So we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about those demands, and then I'll have some closing thoughts on what it all means. Uh, and then uh, Phil and Alex can correct everything that I've done wrong. Uh, so next slide, please, Christine. Thanks. Just real quick uh, about what's going on in Wyoming right now. There's uh, this week there are 17 rigs running in the state. Um, 13 of those 17 are in the Powder River Basin. Uh, obvious where the um, uh, where the attention is in Wyoming. It's been an interesting couple of weeks with respect to uh, to oil and gas prices and uh, global demand and supply. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it in part because it is uh, so uh, bizarre that it's hard to really wrap your uh, arms around what precisely is happening. Uh, I, I submitted these slides a few days ago, so uh, this has already been fluctuating quite a bit, but essentially uh, oil at, at West Texas Intermediates trading uh, in the mid 70s. Um, gas prices just mind-blowingly uh, up above five dollars. Put that into context. Uh, natural gas dropped below four dollars uh, back in, I believe it was September of 2014, and did not climb again above four dollars uh, except for one short month during a very cold spell in 2018, uh, but then went back below. Hadn't been above four dollars since 2014, and here we are at this particular level. It's, uh, it is interesting, uh, and uh, what is bizarre about it is watching um, oil and gas producers and shale producers be very measured in their response to these prices. Uh, we haven't seen uh, production kick up uh, uh, very quickly as a result. It's not saying that it won't, but it hasn't so far. And uh, throughput of oil in Wyoming's pipelines has not increased as well, in fact, it's slightly down. Uh, so a lot of mixed messages going on there with respect to, to what our current operations are. Um, next slide, please. So um, I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that demand, uh, even given the, the bizarre world we're living in, uh, based on two sources that you're both probably, both of which you are all are probably familiar with, the an annual energy outlook from uh, from the uh, Energy Information Administration and then also BP's Energy Outlook. Both of them are slightly dated. They're both uh, slated to come out with new ones here relatively quickly, uh, but this is the latest data that we have. Next slide. So first of all, I wanna talk about demand uh, and, and the sort of narrative that uh, somehow um, uh, fossil fuels are, um, uh, they're so out of vogue that they're going away or dying, et cetera. Uh, this from uh, the EIA, and it doesn't really matter the regions, though I think there's a lot of interesting things to talk about there, particularly as it relates to the global uh, um, energy crisis happening right now, uh, both in China and in the EU. Uh, it's just simply I wanted to, to, to set the stage and, and have you look at the directional um, uh, trajectory of those lines about the uh, energy consumption. It's essentially a measurement of demand uh, globally uh, for uh, for electricity. Next slide, please. This is BP's version of that. And uh, I, I find this one very, very interesting uh, because of what of what it shows, but isn't isn't really listed there. Real quickly, what they're talking about here is, of course, again, global energy demand. They have a different um, a y axis than EIA, but they're talking about the global energy demand. They have these three cases: business as usual, net zero, obviously net zero, uh, as you would expect. And then um, what they expect is, is a more likely scenario, which is rapid, about 70% of the way to net zero by 2050. Um, again, this is a look at, at, at actual demand, not uh, consumption, so uh, not necessarily production. So if you uh, go ahead and click the, the next slide, what that means is that BP has, um, uh, BP has assumed, oh, sorry, I went a little too far there, but that's all right. Um, 
uh, BP has assumed some behavioral changes uh, that will make up that delta between business as usual and the the other two cases. Uh, so uh, uh, just laying my cards on the table here, and particularly as we've seen play out in the last couple of weeks, let's go, sorry, you can go ahead and move forward again. Uh, we, we think that the, um, uh, I think that they're taking some liberties with those assumed behavioral changes. We have seen behavioral changes on the margins uh, but I, I, it's hard for me to see how those behavioral changes will make up that delta. Let's just take a look at crude oil production uh, in the U.S. and the projections for that. I don't know how much you study these things. Um, uh, they're kind of interesting to me. I'm a nerd that way. But, uh, but I, you know, the reference case is, of course, what I think is the most likely. Um, what I think is interesting is, is uh, up there, they talk about high oil and gas supply. Um, what, they're, th what they're talking about there is not that we have an oversupply in the market, which is what we had for a while coming out of the pandemic. What they're talking about is accessible resources at an economic price. Uh, and so you have high oil price and high oil and gas supply, which is actually today where we are uh, more so than the reference case uh, in, in terms of, of where we're moving forward. I'll be interested to see what they project in the next one. Next slide. Same is true for, for dry natural gas production. Uh, you can see the trajectory there. I won't spend more time on that in the interest of time. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, we, we, if we can assume that, that those demand projections are true, then where is it going to, uh, what, what is it going to come from? Uh, EIA here predicts, of course, that around 2030 or so, renewables will overtake natural gas and coal. Uh, interestingly enough, over the past couple of weeks, as natural gas prices have uh, begun to climb, coal production has gone up accordingly. Uh, so already those predictions are, 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 are wrong in, in relation to coal. Next slide. This is BP's look at the same case. Interestingly, BP has renewables going up to nearly 50% of all production uh, of, of primary energy by 2050. The EIA case has renewables at more of about a third. Um, either way, they still have uh, it crossing uh, uh, various fossil fuels at around 2030 to 2035. Next slide. So I need to go ahead and click it twice, uh, Christine. Thanks. So, um, you know, I wanted to, to, to bring that up because I wanted to talk about these two sort of competing theories, both of which are blind spots for those of us that might be, uh, you know, very pro oil and gas. Uh, and for those that might want to just uh, end all oil and gas or fossil fuel use uh, by the end. The first, uh, more on the pro oil and gas side, is, is, is we can tend to fall into this theory that, um, you know, look, uh, the demand is so strong that it'll overcome any objections, that eventually, uh, you know, idealism will fall away to reality and essentially they'll just grow up and realize that, uh, that fossil fuels are required. Uh, there's a blind spot there I want to talk about. And then on the other side, the which is sort of where our current public policy is, at least at the national level, is that these demands will must and will force immediate change. Uh, essentially, that the reality of what the demand is can be overcome with simply heavy handed policy objectives. Next slide. So on the first one on these assumed behavioral changes, uh, this is um, in talking about the they'll grow up theory. Um, we just assume that none of these behavioral changes will happen. And in fact, they will. Go ahead to the next slide, please. And I bring this up because it's important to, for, for folks to know that um, uh, that culture has changed, at least in the United States and in, and, and in the Western world in particular. Um, for the ENR folks, I went down a really long rabbit hole on this. I won't do this again, but this is simply a, a, an attitudinal um, uh, poll regard of, of gen um, of millennials and, and and Gen Z, and you can see on there that they're pretty optimistic about almost everything except for the environment, uh, which is interesting because actually data shows that the environment is what's getting better. Uh, some of these, uh, the rest of them, I'm not sure about. But regardless, this is where the perception is. And so when we talk about uh, uh, changes in ESG or those sorts of things, the uh, the millennial generation and Gen Z who are working in our industry right now are driving changes from the inside. It's not just external market pressures, which are also there, but there's in, in 
institutional changes that are happening within the oil and gas industry. Next slide, please. So uh, that's the, 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 the grow up theory. Uh, blind spot of the grow up theory is the changes that are happening. This uh, moves more to the reality be damned. This is a, a slide from a, a study out of Princeton. Uh, they have a whole institute uh, looking at a, a energy transition. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to show you that this is what, uh, they are very pro transition to wind and solar. This is a look of, of, of um, uh, wind and solar capacity right now in 2020. If you go to the next slide, Christine, this is what they project needs to, uh, wind and solar needs to look like in by 2050 in order to get at least half of the production from wind and solar. Uh, you can obviously see uh, how massive that changes. Uh, next slide, and you can go ahead and click it uh, three times here. So um, these are just uh, uh, pull out quotes from that study, which I find um, uh, very funny uh, in the sense that they talk about finding suitable sites presents a potential bottleneck uh, that onshore wind and solar farms spanning 600,000 square kilometers, which for reference is all of Montana, Wyoming and Colorado combined may have extensive visual impact and that it would require sensitive engagement with communities. So understatements of the year and uh, uh, would really require much more than that. So next slide, please. So what do we do in Wyoming about all this? Um, this is Wyoming's challenge. We have these competing demands. And what, what our challenge is in the industry in Wyoming is to stay in this game from both sides. On the, on the market pressure demands, both internally and externally, uh, we see a lot of movement, of course, in the environmental, social, and governance. Um, methane reductions are very, very important. And uh, as is efforts to move towards a carbon-free energy. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. So we'll run through a few of these here in terms of what companies in Wyoming are already doing. Uh, joining with third party projects like Project Canary to uh, be able to um, uh, stay in the market demand, particularly on our West Coast for, for Wyoming's gas. Next, uh, click it one time here. New startup companies in Wyoming that are working uh, uh, that are working to use artificial intelligence and other sources to help detect leaks and and uh, further reduce our methane emissions and other emissions. Next, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but of course, the using uh, uh, otherwise waste gas uh, in uh, for beneficial uses like crypto mining. Uh, we don't have a lot of flared gas here. Uh, maybe in the Q&A, I can give you some data on that. Uh, be, but these are entrepreneurial solutions to help uh, further uh, private sector entrepreneurial solutions to help further uh, reduce our, our emissions. Next. And one more. So all sorts of efforts at the state level, both our partners in, in uh, the state and also at the Wyoming Energy Authority in terms of driving blue hydrogen and finding uh, uh, better ways, more and better ways to reduce our, uh, uh, our emissions. Next slide. Just a couple more slides here, guys. The trouble is we have all of that going for us on the private sector side, but our current national policy direction asks public land states to shoulder what is a global burden with respect to climate change. And, uh, most, if not all, with the exception of, of EPA methane uh, emissions rules, come from uh, only can affect public land states. And if, if that's all we focus on, then we're not going to be able to move the needle on, on, on global emissions, even necessarily on national emissions, towards any sort of, uh, of goals towards uh, uh, tackling climate change. So you can see them listed here. Um, I, we can talk about them in the Q&A if, if you'd like, uh, but there are certainly um, uh, certainly a lot to talk about on, on all of those. We are actively engaged on, of course, uh, of course, all of these. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to uh, read this at all. You can read it. Um, I realized, though, that I probably should have. Been, th this is from the reconciliation package that's currently being debated ad nauseum uh, at, uh, on Capitol Hill. I realized I should have probably titled this based on a, on a Twitter uh, meme, more like um, something like, uh, tell me you want to end public lands energy development without telling me you want to end public lands energy development. Uh, this is what's in the reconciliation package uh, and uh, 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 would be um, uh, 
pretty terrible for Wyoming's uh, oil and gas producers. We can talk more about that in it as well. Next slide, which I think is my last slide. Finally, on litigation, uh, nearly everything on the list in the previous two slides we are actively involved in, in terms of the advocacy side, and we evaluate every option in terms of, uh, of possible litigation. The leasing moratorium is one of them uh, where we are involved. Um, obviously, we believe that the Biden administration is not following the law with respect to leases. Uh, and we think we have a pretty strong case on that. Uh, just for your information, um, all that news has been uh, focused in Louisiana because of their preliminary, preliminary injunction uh, in Wyoming. Uh, we have moved to the merits of that case. Uh, both uh, industry, the state of Wyoming, and the DOJ have submitted their initial briefs. Uh, and so um, uh, and so that case is moving forward on the merits, and we hope to have uh, information there soon. Uh, finally, I'll, I'll just uh, end on this one, the land use and access closer to home. We have a lot of, uh, of very concerning issues here uh, and, uh, and we'll and spend a lot of time uh, both at regulatory agencies and in the courts dealing with our ability to access land uh, in order to, to develop minerals. Um, there are um, interesting and troubling cases, some of which emanate directly out of uh, University of Wyoming Law School, unfortunately, that uh, we have to deal with on this. So um, we, uh, we will continue to be very, very active on that. And I know that I'm over time, so I'm just going to stop there uh, and we can uh, move on. Thank you very much again for your invitation and attention. Thanks very much, Pete. Next, we have Phil Lowe um, with the Solicitor's Office. I had asked, I told Phil yesterday that this presentation would be really time sensitive if he could jostle the leasing report out of the Department of the Interior. I'm sad to report Phil did not heed my recommendation, but nonetheless, we're looking forward to what he has to say. Thanks, Phil. Well, thank you, Katie. And thanks to the University of the Steering Committee and to Temple for inviting me. And I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm not gonna use a PowerPoint. But if I had one, you can be sure that it would be full of acronyms and citations and there'd be some fine print. And one of the fine print things is whenever you have a government attorney talking in a public forum, they're gonna have a disclaimer. So everything I'm about to say today is my personal observations and opinions it doesn't reflect the official policy of the Department of Interior, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, or the Office of the Solicitor. So, and with that out of the way, I wish I did have some nice pictures of submarines and aircraft carriers and things like that, but you're just gonna have to listen to me talk. Um, so in thinking about this, looking back to the previous seven conferences, I think there's a common theme. And the common theme is all about transition and looking to the future. Um, one of the things about the future is, I think it was Yogi Berra said, it's really hard to predict, especially when it hasn't happened yet. Um, but sometimes looking to the past or looking to current conditions, we can see where things might be going. And I'll just tell you as an aside, back in 1982, I was starting my career. I was a, an environmental scientist with an East Coast utility. I got to stand inside the containment vessel at Susquehanna Unit 2 uh, nuclear power plant while it was obviously fuel hadn't been loaded, anything like that, it was under construction. So this morning's presentations really made me think about that. But one of the things that um, Casey said while moderating, he, he talked about what Governor Gordon said about the all of the above approach to energy. And, and also what Dr. Ahmeyer said, this is not about pitting different energy sources one against the other. And I think given that we're in this time of transition, um, you know, we can look at the Secretary of Interior's remarks from June of this year, where she said right now, you know, there's not a plan right now to ban federal fossil fuel production. That's important. She said oil and gas production is going to be continuing into the future but the department's got to make sure that American taxpayers are getting a good return on their investments for this. And so when we talk about transition, 
Um, Pete mentioned the executive order. So in January, the president issued executive order 14008, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. And section 208 of that executive order directed the department to pause new oil and gas leases onshore and offshore right. until they could complete a comprehensive review and reconsideration of leasing practices. And so we haven't been holding oil and gas sales in Wyoming, but the first quarter sale was not deferred because of the executive order. I think that's important to mention. It was deferred because BLM had some recent setbacks in litigation and was undertaking review to ensure that the new sales would comply with the different court orders that have come out. And I'll get into those in a moment. For the second quarter lease sale, um, there was you know, rationale to defer those sales until the um, study contemplated in the executive order has been completed. And as Katie mentioned, I, I can't really say more about when that report is gonna come out, what's gonna be in it, um, but it is certainly underway. Um, and, and I don't, you know, um, Pete mentioned the four challenges to the executive order. I will say the news was about Louisiana v. Biden with the preliminary injunction. Um, part of that preliminary injunction put BLM back on track to consider leasing, and I will talk about that toward the end. But, you know, in looking to the future, we can look to the past. And we've seen for litigation on onshore oil and gas leasing, particularly in Wyoming, it used to be that individual lease sales would be challenged. They'd be challenged at the Interior Board of Land Appeals. And so there was a single challenge to a single lease sale, and BLM had a pretty good record of having the board affirm those decisions and moving forward, leasing, issuing the leases, seeing those leases go into production. Um, some lease sales went into um, federal litigation in other states, and examples of that is where the lease sale was coupled with a resource management plan amendment. And resource management plans are essentially zoning writ large for the BLM. Where, when, and how are we going to be offering public lands for particular uses? I won't go into all the details of that, but some of you may have heard about the Roan Plateau case in Colorado or the Chihuahuan grasslands case in New Mexico. But basically, in those cases, federal courts took a look at things and, and determined whether BLM was complying with the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, or FLIPMA, the Federal Land Policy Management Act. Um, the trend has changed. Recently, um, the trend has been to challenge multiple lease sales from multiple BLM states in a single federal court case. There are a number of cases that's going on right now across the country. There's 16 different cases in federal courts challenging more than 5,000 leases in eight BLM state offices. And I, I say BLM state offices, I'm including Eastern states, which is multiple states. Montana and the Dakotas is two states. And for those of you in Wyoming, you know that Wyoming BLM also has some management obligations in Nebraska, but they're very small. So 5,000 leases challenged, 16 different cases. I'm only going to talk about three of those really quickly. Um, and they are cases that have directly impacted Wyoming leasing decisions and what BLM is doing about them. The first is the Montana Wildlife Federation case in Great Falls, Montana. And that case was brought to challenge an instruction memorandum, which was a policy which essentially said the resource management plans that came about for um, protecting sage grouse habitat um, had an objective to prioritize leasing outside of sage grouse habitat. BLM in a previous two administrations ago in the Obama administration had an instruction man memorandum. Here is how you can meet that prioritization objective to lease outside. In the Trump administration, that I am changed. Advocacy groups brought suit in Montana 
and said that change in the IM, and for those of you who keep score on this, it's IM 2018-026, it was prioritization, um, essentially violated FLIPMA. And in that case, Judge Morris vacated the underlying leases that were issued from lease sales in Montana, Wyoming, and uh, Nevada. The second case I wanna talk about is Western Watersheds Project. Um, that's a case in Idaho. And again, Western Watersheds challenged multiple lease sales in multiple jurisdictions. And there, the hook was another instruction memorandum, which I am 2018-034, which set out timelines for trying to streamline the process for how BLM does oil and gas leasing. That challenged leases in Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, and Montana, and there, Magistrate Judge Bush found that the IM was not lawfully issued. It should have been issued subject to notice and comment rulemaking, and Judge Bush vacated the underlying leases involved in that litigation. And then the third big one is really two cases, and that's Wild Earth Guardians brought suit challenging um, leasing decisions in Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, Utah, and New Mexico. And the first case, um, Judge Contreras, and these cases dealt with greenhouse gas emissions. Judge Contreras in the first case said, you did not adequately analyze the downstream effects of greenhouse gas emissions from the end use of the fossil fuels that you're leasing. And so, um, in that case, in Wild Earth Guardians, BLM went back to the drawing board, did additional NEPA analysis, um, provided that information, but there was a subsequent suit. And again, Wild Earth Guardians brought it in um, district court in DC, challenging the same lease sales. Um, if we go to the um, Montana Wildlife and Western Watersheds cases, both of those are on appeal right now in the Ninth Circuit. Um, for the associated IMs with those, they've been withdrawn. Um, and the cases are now, we're waiting for a decision on the Ninth Circuit on whether it was appropriate to vacate the underlying leases, whether it was appropriate for in the um, Montana case to hear challenges to Wyoming leases in Montana, and whether it was appropriate in. Um, in Idaho for the judge to require BLM to go back to um, a different IM. So, so what's this all tell us? We've got a federal leasing program where judges have found that BLM didn't take the appropriate steps to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act. So right now BLM is trying to go through the process to address what the, the inadequacies that the judges have found and address that, and how are they doing that? And typically in a lease sale, you have a nomination, um, BLM identifies the nominations, determines whether um, the land is actually BLM's to lease, whether it's open for leasing under the RMP, and then BLM goes through environmental analyses to um, look at that, submits those environmental analyses for public scoping and public comment, responds to the public comments, responds to protests, um, determines whether those protests should be granted or not, and then finally um, moves forward to a competitive lease sale. What I can tell you is right now, Wyoming is taking a look and has just finished the scoping process for a lease sale to be undertaken towards the end of this year, beginning of next year. Um, the draft NEPA documents that are currently in place are going to uh, currently being processed are going to take a look at the deficiencies identified in the WWP, Montana Wildlife Federation, and Wild Earth Guardians cases. They're going to be look, looking at greenhouse gas analysis, sage grouse issues, cumulative effects. And so um, what I can tell you is that while oil and gas leasing has not completely stop, it's been subject to setbacks. And as part of those setbacks, BLM is trying to undertake the appropriate environmental analyses to ensure um, 
that they can have defensible decisions when federal leases are issued. And I'd, I'd just like to say that the, the process here, it's iterative and it's building and it's always looking to the future in terms of what is going to be the impact of leasing particular lands and how are those impacts disclosed and how are they addressed through mitigation. Um, at the end of the day, and I think we'll talk about this in um, more detail in Q&A, but at the end of the day, BLM is mandated under the Mineral Leasing Act to have these lease sales on a quarterly basis if it can. And right now with all of this litigation, BLM's trying to work through and determine how it can go forward in the appropriate way. And I think Alex is gonna speak a little bit more on um, his perspectives on the litigation. But again, understanding my disclaimer in the beginning of this speech, I can say that BLM is still in the oil and gas business and working to ensure that future decisions comply with NEPA, FLIPMA, and will be defensible when they're challenged. And so with that, I'd turn it back to Katie. Thank you. Thanks very much, Phil. That was really informative. I appreciate your perspective on the department and where it may be going. Next up, we have Alex Obrecht with Baker Hostetler. He's here to give a case law and regulatory update. Um, and once he's done, then we'll do a little moderated question and answer, and as well as take audience question and answers. So please feel free to drop those in the uh, Q&A section of the chat. Thanks very much, Alex. All right, well, thank you, Katie. Uh, first off, I'd like to apologize to everybody watching online. Uh, despite 18 months of COVID, uh, I have never been able to find the right video configuration with my camera. Usually I look like I'm in the witness protection program. Now I look like uh, I've got my head like an orange on a toothpick uh, from the Mike Myers movie, uh, How I Married My Axe Murder. So I apologize to everyone in advance. Uh, I'd like to thank Temple Stollinger, Christine Reed, and Emily Sorensen, and the rest of the folks at SCR for putting this on. I know pivoting at the last minute to a remote conference took a, took a lot of effort and a lot of work behind the scenes. And I really appreciate everything they've done to make sure this runs smoothly. Now, I'd like to just talk a little bit quickly to kind of uh, put some guideposts on where we'll, where we'll be going today. And next slide, if you could, Christine. Uh, first, as you heard both Pete touch on with PAW's litigation in Wyoming and Phil discussing, Right now, the oil and gas focus from the federal agenda really is on federal leasing policy, litigation, and also to a, to a lesser extent, um, some of the uh, permitting issues that have been faced during the, during the time. But the courts are still sorting out, and as is the current administration, uh, the regulations uh, that were issued during the two previous uh, administrations related to oil and gas. And there are the largest hot button topics, um, or at least the hot button, hot button topics of the past, hydraulic fracturing, venting and flaring, federal royalties, and the like. And so I think it's fair to say that some of the focus on the leasing policy has some of the expected proposed rules slightly on the back burner. Um, but some are starting to trickle out, and we have more that are expected uh, as soon. Uh, with the uh, issuance in June of the Unified Agenda and federal regulatory and deregulatory actions from the Biden administration. So next slide, please, Christine. I just want to take a quick minute uh, to kind of step back, and this comes as no surprise to Wyomingites and the other folks from Western states here. But when we talk about the federal oil and gas agenda, wh why this is important for Wyoming is just because the vast majority of the state is controlled or has some sort of nexus to a federal agency. In order for our extractive industries period, but specifically oil and gas, like we're here today to talk about to thrive, we need to have a consistent, coherent, and beneficial regulatory scheme from the federal agencies related to how we're going to produce our, uh, produce our uh, oil and gas for the mutual benefit of the uh, federal coffers, the state coffers, 
um, and all the all the folks in this, in the state um, here in Wyoming we don't necessarily have the option uh, to move from federal lands to fee lands uh, as you might elsewhere um, it's just sometimes we're stuck with the federal uh, the federal acreage that we have to develop and we can skip uh, two slides ahead, please, Christine. Now, federal oil and gas results in about $3 billion in revenue annually to the federal coffers. And of course, half of that is split with the states from which those products are produced. Now, while $3 billion might seem paltry compared to the $3.5 billion trillion dollar infrastructure plan being put forward now, I think it's worth noting that the oil and gas program is the second largest source of revenue behind the Internal Revenue Service to the uh, to the U.S. government. Um, it is vitally important, and it needs to seriously be considered. Where, when we talk about changes to royalty regimes and how much more we are going to pay, uh, oil and gas operators are going to be asked to pay. Um, that needs to be considered in conjunction with the additional burdens it takes to actually develop on federal land. And to put all those things together and make sure we are not indeed forcing um, our oil and gas industry off of the federal land to um, private private land, as we've already seen, I think, with exodus to fee, uh, uh, fee, fee production in, in Texas, primarily. Uh, next slide, please, Christine. And so, this, this slide, I believe, is quite, quite informative. Uh, it's from the George Washington uh, University uh, Law School's Regulatory uh, Studies Center. And so it, it tracks a number of major final rules. And final rules are rules that generically have an impact of over $100 million on the economy. And in large part, what, what we were talking about for oil and gas regulations and what we're still sorting out through the courts in Wyoming, the Tenth Circuit, the Northern District of California, and the Ninth Circuit and elsewhere, are the final, the final years of these administrations' oil and gas policies. So the 2016, uh, 2016 policies from the Obama administration and the 2020 uh, major final rules from the Trump administration. And so when I talk about why we're still sorting these out, um, there's been just a massive amount of forum shopping. And of course, that's ex to be expected. Um, but there's been quite a bit of ping ponging um, between presumably favorable and unfavorable jurisdictions. Um, so we have seen a number of cases uh, challenging Obama regulations in, the, in Wyoming and elsewhere. Then when the Trump administration came around and issued a rescission or potentially a new rule, those cases were then taken and challenged in the Northern District of California. And so it appears to be a clear forum shopping for a policy outcome rather than looking at the actual legal merits of the case. Because uh, when we come down to it, the, the APA, it allows considerable latitude for policy changes, even if that policy change is 180 degrees. Um, the appropriate procedures just need to be followed. So I want to look at how this has played out with a few of the, uh, the past regulations. So next, thank you, Christine. Uh, so first, starting with the hydraulic fracturing rule. Um, the Obama administration issued its final rule in 2015, uh, and it was a very extensive rulemaking process from 2010 all the way to 2015. Um, that, that rule was challenged in, uh, in the District of Wyoming, um, it was challenged both by states, a tribe, um, and industry. And Judge Gavdal uh, preliminary enjoined the rule in September of 2015 and later vacated it in 2016. And the hook um, for overturning the rule was jurisdiction. Essentially, the EPA had jurisdiction, not the Bureau of Land Management, to regulate hydraulic fracturing. And of course, that, that uh, was appealed to the Tenth Circuit. Um, but the Tenth Circuit ended up vacating the district court decision uh, on procedural grounds. And so uh, they, and then that was due to uh, the Trump administration's announcement that it was planning to rescind uh, the Obama, the Obama rule. Uh, but that created a little bit of an interesting wrinkle. 
um, because the only court in the District of Wyoming to consider the merits of the 2015 rule had actually um, set it aside for violations, uh, violations of statutory jurisdiction. Um, but now the Tenth Circuit had vacated that opinion. So it created questions about exactly what is the law of the land? Is it the regulations that have been in place since 1982? Or had the 2015 Obama rule actually been put into place? So next slide, please, Christine. And so the Trump administration did eventually issue uh, a rescission uh, of, of the Obama administration's 2015 rule. And that again was challenged in the uh, Northern District of California, uh, where special interest groups did indeed argue uh, that Judge Skavdal's opinion was null and void, and that should the rescission um, be set aside, that the 2015 rule would instantly become the law of the land. Now that ultimately did not happen as uh, Judge, Judge Gillingham in the Northern District uh, of California set aside or upheld the rescission rule. Um, and it was a very, uh, very thought out opinion that essentially did say that all I am here to do is to test whether the administration met its APA requirements. And on this record, while I might not agree with the policy change, the Trump yeah, the judge found the Trump administration did comply with the APA. Now, there's been an interesting wrinkle in this case as it was issued in March of 2020, and there has been an appeal pending in the Ninth Circuit for quite some time. Now, it has been administratively closed at the request, uh, request of the government. Um, I think it has gone through two iterations, and it is now administratively closed until November 15th, 2021. Now, this leads us to the next slide, and that's what's next. Um, presumably the government has put this on administrative, uh, administrative hold because they're planning a new, new regulation that will be issued sometime soon. Or they could just be simply trying to figure out exactly which approach they want to take. And I don't think the question of whether there's going to be a hydraulic fracturing ban is really even a question anymore. While that might've been hot in the primaries, uh, it was largely backed away, backed away from by President Biden. But there is still a question of whether um, the administration, which seems more focused on climate change, is going to actually come back to the hydraulic fracturing rule and reissue a new rule. Most people would think that they would, but in the most recent regulatory agenda, uh, hydraulic fracturing wasn't on. Now, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, the venting and flaring rule, it creates an even, uh, it's an even more convoluted path. Um, so the Obama rule has been, uh, has been set aside again by the Northern, uh, by uh, the District of Wyoming. And again, the hook there was also jurisdictional. Essentially the BLM was acting outside of its, uh, outside of its authority and that authority should have resided with the EPA. But that, that rule didn't get ruled on by the merits uh, by the District of Wyoming until the Trump rescission um, had been thrown out uh, by the District of California in 2020. And now there's a little clearer picture for venting and flaring related to what's next. Uh, this was on the regulatory agenda uh, for the Biden administration and the proposed rule is expected in October of 2021. But at least as, as I had checked yesterday, uh, nothing had been submitted uh, unofficially uh, or officially in the, in the Federal Register. So we're still waiting on this. Now, there's a slight contrast between uh, the hydraulic fracturing rule in venting and uh, venting and flaring compared to uh, the Office of Natural Resources Revenues royalty rule. And so the Obama rule, again, was challenged in the District of Wyoming. It was actually recently upheld um, by the District of Wyoming. In contrast, Trump's, re Trump's rescission, um, it had been vacated again in the Northern, Northern District of California. And in a rush to fix, um, fix the, over, uh, the, the courts overturning the rescission rule, the Trump administration was unsuccessful in finalizing a 2020 rule related to royalties. So now, the final, the final law of the land, uh, subject to appeal, of course, is that the 2016 honor rule will be in place. 
And one issue I think that contrasts the two previous rules with the royalty rule is the fact that the jurisdictional hook wasn't really at play. It wasn't a question. I mean, that is the Office of Natural Resources Revenue's job is federal royalties. And I think we, we see uh, in the opinion from, uh, from Judge Skavdal, a level-headed approach to actually applying the APA, specifically recognizing that going from one end, one end of the spectrum to the other is a horrible, it's a horrible way to regulate, it's a horrible way to govern. But when I'm looking at this case, I'm looking at it solely from the perspective of the APA. And within the APA, the agency can change its mind. And so it must be as long as it actually explains its decision and takes the appropriate procedural steps. Now, I know Phil, Phil touched on uh, the federal leasing litigation, at least, from, at least from the industry perspective, it does seem uh, to be quite full of doom and gloom. Uh, but there is at least one bright spot. Um, the Wild, Wild Earth Ga Guardians challenged a number of lease sales um, in, in New Mexico. Um, it, it was noteworthy because it was probably the largest monetary value uh, for the lease sales. These are Permian, Permian leases, um, and collectively they had about $1.1 billion in bonus revenue. Um, but that, the court there upheld that lease sale. And I would, would challenge most to uh, look at the NEPA analysis that was done in this case versus the NEPA analysis that has been challenged elsewhere and overturned and question, question how much, uh, how different the NEPA analysis related to climate change really were, yet they were upheld here in the District of New Mexico. And of course that decision has been appealed, um, but the Tenth Circuit uh, has stayed that appeal and it has stayed it for mediation. Um, although industry has intervened, um, both IPAA and API, um, it is, uh, or uh, Western Energy Alliance, excuse me, um, it leaves one to question whether there is, uh, there are talks of various uh, updates to the NEPA analysis there uh, between, the, between the NGO uh, and the government. And again, similar to Judge Scavdall's opinion, I think uh, Judge Brack in the District of New Mexico uh, laid, out, uh, laid out a clear line to how, how these cases should be viewed from the APA perspective. Um, he, he notes, amid these tensions, the court has a simple role to apply the law as it stands without comment on the underlying policies. Now I'm running, running short on time, but we do at least have two, uh, two rules um, that are issued, uh, uh, have been issued by the Obama, or Biden administration, excuse me. Uh, first is a Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, they have overturned, uh, overturned the Trump administration's um, interpretation uh, that the Migratory Bird Treaty Act did not prevent incidental take. Um, it is also a notice of proposed rulemaking related to a potential permit program uh, for incidental tank and authorizing incidental tank. Now, of course, the devil is going to be in the details of what that proposed uh, permitting program looks like, things such as cost, scope of the permits, delay in permitting, and et cetera. As well, there's also been, uh, been announced, uh, should have been published officially in the Federal Register yesterday, um, updates to NEPA regulations, and it will largely be a rescission of the 2020 rule issued, uh, issued in the last year of the Trump administration. Now, I wanna conclude um, with, of course, it is a, a worn out theme at times, uh, but the, the data does support a federal exodus of oil and gas production. Now, while that might be because there's move, movements to more productive, more productive basements, mainly the Permian or a certain certain basins in the in the East Coast in Pennsylvania, um, I think it is something that needs to be taken into consideration when considering federal policy moving forward. Uh, it's not necessarily that we are decreasing. Uh, the amount of oil and gas produced in the uh, in the United States. It's uh, where where that oil and gas is actually being produced from. So thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back to Katie. Thanks, Alex. And at this point, I'd like to ask Alex, Pete, and Phil to all turn on their cameras. Thank you very much. And we'll do a little moderated Q&A. 
Um, I see some questions. I've got some questions for the panelists, and then I see some in the chat, and I encourage others to put some in the chat. Um, I also see one commenting on the head and the head on a toothpick um, comparison, and I'm just I'm going to leave that one sit. But nonetheless, um, thanks everyone. And and the first question is I'm going to direct it at Alex, but I welcome everyone else's thoughts to the extent they have any. Alex, you had talked about, you gave an over, a very nice overview of a lot of the litigation surrounding the Obama-Trump rules. And, and particularly, one thing that I witnessed was that the Trump administration had a difficult time trying to administratively undo some of the Obama rules, namely vetting and flaring. And the, the Trump administration also tried to administratively undo the, some of the natural office and natural resources revenue rules as well. And so what is what do you think that that case law has, like what is the, the effect of that case law or those efforts on the Biden administration's efforts to undo some of the Trump rules and namely the, the CEQ rules. Because the, the new CEQ rules were really not just a reversal of you know, the prior administration's rules, but really an, um, on their face and a, a, a real wholesale update to the, to the NEPA rules. So does, does the case law kind of guide what we might see for future Biden efforts? Yeah, so I think the the primary point that needs to be followed by the Biden administration here is that you're free to change policy um, and you're free to change policy in 180 degrees. You just have to document what you're doing, build your record and make sure you're putting extra scrutiny into the procedural aspect required by the APA and the related case law. And so to put that into, you know, kind of actual actual terms of what needs to be done, you know, don't act. You can't act too quickly. You got to make sure you're giving the appropriate time for public comment. Um, you got to make sure that you're building a good administrative record. Put the documentation in for why you are taking action you're going to take. Um, and then finally, explain the action that you're going to take. Uh, it can't just be something that is uh, preordained and given, given short thrift in the preamble to any regulatory rule. Uh, each step needs to be followed, and the more you're deviating from past policy, it probably needs to have extra focus put on. And realistically, what that means for boots on the ground is they have to have not only the career staff there, but the political, political appointees in place to guide and shepherd these types, of, these types of decisions so they'll stand up to court scrutiny of the APA's requirements. Yeah, but I think that I think that's right. I mean, that's easy. That's always easy to say. I had to laugh when you when you said that the a court's job is easy. It just has to interpret the law. And I thought, yeah, that's like telling me, yeah, you just have to fly a plane, right? Just fly the plane. Um, so and and similarly, it's it's easy to say to agencies, this is what you need to do. But it, but what we've seen is a lot of judicial. Um, scrutiny, a real, a real hard look at what agencies have been doing and why. And I think that the kind of mixed bag of case law reflects that. Well, my next question here is for, for Pete. And Pete, you, had you did a really nice job of some of the legislative changes that we may see coming out of the reconciliation bill. But just today, I had I saw a um, an E and E article that there was some congressional legislation introduced to change the non competitive leasing program, and I was just curious. I thought that was really timely. Non competitive leasing has been the subject of a lot of chatter in the last couple of years. I think the GAO had a report on it about a year ago and suggested that it did not garner the same kind of revenue as competitive leasing. And I was curious about if that. Um, if non-competitive leasing was really curbed or just eliminated, what effect that might have on Wyoming in particular? Thanks, Katie. I, uh, thanks for that question. I appreciate it. I've, um, I, I think I had an op-ed about this in the Star Tribune a couple of weeks ago or a month ago or so, so I've got, a, I've got probably too much to say about it. But real quick to Alex's point about, about the APA and all that, which I thought was very great. Um, part of it is in the natural resource space, I think we have been uh, where the national dialogue is on lots of other subjects for a long time, where Congress has really abdicated its duty 
and uh, and has just shouldered the agency with uh, an enormous amount of, of authority and policy creation authority that's now being challenged uh, and, and, and dealt with in the courts. The Article I branch of government is absent from this and uh, because they're dysfunctional in a lot of ways uh, and we haven't been able to, to really make any sort of headway uh, on that. So uh, to your question, uh, you know, the reconciliation bill does have an end to so-called non-competitive leases. Uh, and so, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to move that, that direction. We'll see whether it happens. As it relates to Wyoming, I mean, it's, you said it yourself, it's uh, the GAO said that, that non-competitive leasing garners less revenue than competitive leasing. Um, I, I guess, you know, in, in the words of, uh, of Homer Simpson, duh. Um, of course, it's exactly the way it is supposed to be. And uh, the, the debate around the narrative around non-competitive leasing uh, has really, um, is really unfortunate for Wyoming because let's, uh, I think what, what the GAO and others have in mind is that somehow everyone knows precisely where the best uh, resource is and the largest producing companies uh, will just go and, and poke a hole and get it. Uh, that's not how it works, and I think everyone, or at least maybe everyone on the, on this call, understands that. That in Wyoming, we 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 have to we have to push the edges of the boundaries of our resource play in order to find what the next resource is going to be. And the larger exploration production companies are not going to do that. They don't have the, uh, th that, that's not what their business model is. We need the smaller companies out there with some half-baked notion about where a resource is going to be and they have to convince their management to go explore there at great risk so it always is it's, it, it's always very interesting to me to for for people to say well it doesn't garner enough resources that land by itself is garnering no resources none uh, as it is just sitting there and i think something like 80 or 90 i get check my numbers on it of of these non-competitive leases end up not getting developed at all but during that entire time is garnering revenue and then when they do find something that can be actually produced it tends to be the smaller companies that ended up moving that over to larger companies that both through economies of scale can produce it and that's what generates the revenue as alex said the second largest amount of revenue behind the irs uh so it, it, it it's it's a process and i just i have a hard time understanding how shutting down the very beginning of that pipeline where people are taking risks precisely because there is no guarantee that there's a resource there. That's why it's non-competitive. It becomes competitive when it's the Powder River Basin. But when you don't know that, we need these smaller companies in Wyoming to, to be able to access that in a way that allows them to find our new resource so the larger companies can, can develop it and earn revenue for, for the federal government and for the state of Wyoming. So uh, unfortunately, there's just a lot of narrative around non-competitive leasing. I think it's largely either um, uh, it's, it's politically driven because some folks know that that would be, make it challenging for Wyoming. And in some cases, it's just because people don't understand that process. So Pete, I'm going to follow up with you and I'm going to ask a question that I'm not sure I would ask in person. So this is a this is a benefit of the virtual event because this is <laughs> I, I know I'm in Wyoming and I might get some like rotten fruit thrown in my head. But to your point that Congress has sort of abdicated this responsibility, we have a pretty comprehensive package in Congress to do some, I don't know what the changes, let's just call them changes to the federal leasing program. And what is there anything that's palatable? I mean, or where is where is the state of Wyoming and Petroleum Association on on the these changes, or do they do, or do they just oppose them pretty much entirely? Well, yeah, thanks, Katie. And um, I, I'm not going to throw fruit virtually. Um, it's a fair question, uh, and I think it, it you have to break them out individually taken as a, I'm not sure if you're asking about the reconciliation package or, or yes, other things. Um, you know, obviously, you, to your previous question, Senator Hickenlooper and Senator Heinrich introduced the bill today regarding non-competitive leases. Um, uh, reconciliation, of course, is a list of all, uh, you know, by process needs to be uh, essentially about revenue and, and revenue generation. 
So, uh, you know, that uh, the authors of that look at uh, the dollars attached to uh, all those things in that really long list and think that they can squeeze for more and more and more. Now, if you if you take each one individually, there, there may be things that we can talk about there. Um, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know where the line is. I don't think anyone knows where the line is, where the expense gets too great to continue to operate in a place like Wyoming. Wyoming is already among the most, if not the most expensive place to, to develop oil and gas. Uh, so where do, we, where do we cross that line where everyone moves out and goes to North Dakota and Texas and, and, and overseas? I don't know what that is. And, and each individual company and each individual association looks at them individually and can have reasonable discussions about that. Unfortunately, I don't think we're having lots of reasonable discussions. We're, we're tied up in, in, in um, in, in rhetoric about how it's all going away and it's all dying. And so what does it matter? And, and you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I'd be happy to have individual conversations about any, any one of those, but, but conversations can be had and should be had. I'm pausing just because I didn't know, Alex, I saw you nodding. I don't know if you want to add anything or not. I think you're on mute. 18 months, still can't do it. Uh, the, the only thing I would add is I do think, uh, I, I, I like Pete's point about uh, more or less the, the loudest voices on every end of the spectrum are, are, are the ones getting, uh, getting the focus uh, rather than really looking at uh, what can be done in the middle to move forward in a coherent path. And I mean, unfortunately that is just the way it happens. Um, but I think it impedes the the overall perception of not only the industry, but of the regulators uh, and even of NGOs that are trying to accomplish very, very reasonable things. Um, and so the whole goal of, say, a statute like NEPA um, that is, you know, originally supposed to be just a procedural statute, not to dictate a substantive outcome, um, has ultimately become a sword to create such policy made decisions on a substantive outcome. Well, thanks to you both. I, I could keep going, but I wanna, I wanna give some uh, time for the audience questions. Um, one of them is for Pete. Uh, great presentation, thank you. What is PAW's vision for Wyoming's, Wyoming's energy economic future in the next 50 years? Taking over the world. No, <laughs> um, yeah, I appreciate that question. I, I, I think, um, look, there's, uh, I touched on it very briefly, probably too briefly in, in my presentation. But the, there is um, there is significant external market demands and internal cultural demands to continue to improve uh, uh, the emissions profile, uh, both from you know from uh, methane and and carbon and uh, and um, uh, any other criteria emissions or any of that uh, as we move forward. I think we have uh, we, we have a good track record there and I think we can do even more uh, and still keep Wyoming at the forefront. So uh, um, just real quickly on the on the history of it, uh, you know since between 1990 and 2017 emissions in Wyoming of criteria pollutants have gone down 64 percent while production has increased 30 percent. So we, we've, we've made a lot of strides, we can make more, and we have to make more in order to stay relevant to our buyers on the West Coast, uh, in particular. So you will see individual companies, just as a matter of, of good business practice, um, making significant strides to do that. From my standpoint as a Petroleum Association of Wyoming, I want Wyoming to be able to be in this space for a very long time. And I want to help uh, both my, uh, my members and also the state uh, find ways to do that. Is that carbon capture? Probably. Is it carbon capture that, that leads towards uh, blue hydrogen and, and, and further hydrogen development? Probably. Is it finding ways to uh, incentivize policies that, that bring value chain closer to Wyoming? Uh, think about um, a discussion we had with the blockchain task force a couple of weeks ago about having uh, uh, essentially um, a data campus in, in Wyoming close to oil and gas development where, uh, where we can help meet the energy needs of, of computer processing and data storage and yes, crypto mining, 
that helps to uh, to bring these value chains closer to Wyoming. There's all of these that I think can be done, and Wyoming has some significant um, uh, competitive advantages here, particularly as it relates to natural gas. Uh, um, I, I don't want to filibuster here, but let me just talk about about flaring for one second. Um, you know, in 2020, Wyoming uh, uh, vented and flared something on the order of uh, about about 12,000 uh, MCF a day, 12,500 12, MCF a day. Um, by comparison, the Delaware and Permian basins uh, in 2020 flared about 200 million MCF a day. So we do not have a lot of waste gas, but what we can do is use that network and, and capture that in an aggregated sense uh, to help drive a new economy in Wyoming. And there's all sorts of exciting things we can do there. And I, I hope that I hope that we're, like I said in my slides, we need to stay in the game. And I hope that the federal government allows us to stay in the game. Well, and I don't see any more audience questions. I, I, if anybody has a follow up for Pete, please put a put it in the the chat box. But I guess I'll um, just I'll follow up with my own question then. And this is just really a point of curiosity. Have you seen Wyoming's uh, um, rig count and sort of numbers rebound at the same pace as some of the other states like Texas and North Dakota? Are, are you? Is it faster, slower? Where are you as compared? And I'm talking, excuse me, I'm talking about rebound from the pandemic crisis. Where are you relative to uh, to other states? Uh, it, it's slower than I would like, um, uh, but again, it's been slower. I think uh, you know, New Mexico recently overtook North Dakota as a, as the number two. Um, I think both North Dakota and Wyoming have been slower than than either I or NDPC would like to uh, to have seen my colleagues up there. We're at 17 rigs. That's about half where we were pre-pandemic. -pan pre um, I, I think you know, the, the good news about that, the silver lining for that is that I think the companies are really, um, they're thinking very carefully about uh, uh, how to position themselves moving forward, um, both because of investor demands uh, and also because of, uh, you know, in the, in the publicly traded space in terms of making sure that they uh, are meeting the demands of their shareholders and, and, uh, and boards of directors uh, in terms of ESG uh, um, requirements and in terms of just uh, being able to, uh, to maintain their capital. Uh, and so I feel like um, this is just this is just me speculating. So please don't take this to the bank. But but I feel like they're really trying to uh, position themselves for the long term here. And if Wyoming can weather that and and uh, not have external sources or shut that down, I think we will be in a strong place. Uh, and at least that's my hope. Uh, maybe I'm being Pollyannish about it, but but that's my hope. Well, we've got one question that'll probably take us to the end of this session. Um, and this is from Representative Henderson. Are there opportunities for enhancing a unified, quote, all of the above message to promote the value chain Wyoming offers? And I think I'll direct that at you again, Pete. Oh, uh, thanks. And hi, Representative Henderson, appreciate that. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know, probably uh, Alex may have some thoughts here too, I don't know, but um, when, when I mentioned that uh, the blockchain task force and them talking about aggregating energy sources in order to meet a new, uh, a new economy, there's no reason why that has to be oil and gas alone. That could be small modular reactors, that could be wind and solar as well. We're going to need all of that if we're going to try to, uh, I mean, I think you know, Representative Henderson, the, the, the energy demands coming from the crypto mining community is, is will, will blow your mind. Um, we don't, we simply don't, we don't have it in Wyoming right now. And we will need all sources to try to help Wyoming move to a, a to an economy that welcomes that, like they're, like they're trying to do on the banking and finance side. Uh, other places have more energy for the for that economy, and so we, we need to. Uh, it's, it's sort of all hands on deck if we want to be a part of that from an energy development standpoint. Uh, there, there's probably more, um, uh, so I'll, I'll think about it more, uh, Bill, and we can we can talk more later. Well, Alex, I think we have um, one more minute left. If you want to add any clo closing thoughts. Thanks, Katie. I think everyone probably feels as though they've heard enough from me today. I, I think we'll leave it there.
Well, I really appreciate all the panelists' time and thoughts. These were, this was a great session. We really appreciate it. Thanks to the University and Temple, Temple for putting this together and having us here. Um, this is always such a great program, so I really hope we can see you all next, next fall in person. Me too. Thanks, Katie, and, and thanks to the panelists. Great conversation. That was really informative. We're going to take a lunch break now, um, and we will come back uh, at 12 o'clock, and we'll have a short presentation from the ENR section of the State Bar, and we'll award the Salt Creek Scholarship as well. So join us at 12, and then uh, we'll follow that with our last panel of the day. So enjoy your lunch, and we'll see you at 1. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.